All right, so we are making our way through Unit 6 of Jews, Israel, and Jesus. And Unit 6 is covenant. We've been talking about God's covenant between himself and his people. And we've just finished up looking at the new covenant, but now we need to talk about the after effects of the new covenant being in place. So we've made it up to point H, which is the old covenant is fading away, but is still in effect for the Jewish people. So this is something that we need to handle delicately because just because there is a new covenant doesn't mean that the old covenant has been disposed of. No, as we talked about, the old covenant remains as long as heaven and earth remain. Then that is their term limit and their term will be up. But we have this condition now where the new covenant exists and the old covenant exists, but the old covenant is not a way of salvation because there is no temple, there's no opportunity for making sacrifices in the one place where God will accept them made unto his name. And don't forget that no one in human history except for Jesus has ever been able to attain righteousness by keeping the law. So through the works of the law, no one will be justified. It is only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that the old covenant doesn't still exist. So let's look at these issues. Issues. Let's look at some of the scriptures and talk about how this works. So the new covenant, the new covenant has a better hope, better promises, better priesthood, and it is sworn with an oath. I basically just did a recap of the book of Hebrews for you. The new covenant is superior to the old covenant. So the old covenant then is therefore fading away. What used to be the only way that God had made for people to draw near to him now is is not as good as the way that has been made through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, starting with verse 18. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. So the law was weak and useless. And we talked about that. And the quote is there in your study guide, Romans 8, 3, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. So the law is not weak and the law is not imperfect. The law is perfect, but human weakness and fleshly imperfection, no one has ever been able to attain righteousness through the law. So that makes the law seem ineffective because no one has ever been able to do it, except that Jesus did it. He said, don't think I came to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. But no one else in all of human history has ever been able to attain it. The law made nothing perfect. The scripture continues, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So remember, in the old covenant, only the high priest could go into the presence of God, and that only once a year. But now, because Jesus has sacrificed himself and atoned for our sin, we all can draw near to God with confidence that our sin has been washed away, that our sin has has been forgiven and atoned for so that we can draw near to God and be in his presence, each and every one of us. This is a better hope, a better hope of eternal life and dwelling with God forever. But through the sacrifice of Jesus, not the sacrifices of bulls and goats and sheep. We're at verse 20. And it was not without an oath. And we talked about how the new covenant is sworn with an oath. That makes the priesthood superior to the priesthood of the old covenant. And he goes on, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Okay, so we've read this scripture before, but I wanted you to hear it again. So we're getting it in the context of the new covenant has now been established. The old covenant now is fading away because the new covenant gives a better hope and Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, starting with verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, 
made not with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Okay, so this is talking about the tabernacle. The tabernacle was made with skins and with linen, and there were curtains, and there was a covering, and the tabernacle was made with things that were made by human hands. But Jesus entered into heaven itself, not into an earthly tent. And he didn't enter into the presence of God because goats and bulls were sacrificed. He entered in based on the sacrifice of himself, which is the perfect sacrifice of immeasurable, uncountable value, because it is not just an animal, but it is a person. And it is not just a person, but it is the Son of God. It is God himself. That has immeasurable value. So for those of you listening in places or cultures where, you know, it still functions in this way, and let's say that you kill by accident someone's chicken, then you need to pay money for the price of a chicken. Well, but if you accidentally kill someone's goat, then you have to pay the money for the goat, and the goat has a higher value than the chicken. If you kill someone's cow, then the cow has a much higher value than the goat or than the chicken. So now if you were to place a value on a human life, that would be much more valuable than a cow or a goat or a chicken. But then take that up even a hundred more notches, notches up to infinity, that it's God. It is the Son of God. The perfect sacrifice was sacrificed so that we draw near to God, not based on something that has a a little bit of value, but we can be confident and assured that the penalty, the cost, the price for our sin has been atoned for, has been paid in full. The requirement for righteousness has been met because Jesus offered himself and he entered into the holy places and God accepted his sacrifice. So let's jump down to verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So, when the Israelites, when the elders and Moses went up on the mountain and they saw God, this was when the first covenant was cut, the old covenant, they saw God and he appeared to be standing over something that was as blue as the sky. So this is God dwelling in the heaven, but meeting with him there on the earth. But he was standing over the sky. He is above the heavens. He is higher than the heavens. But then when Moses remained on the mountain, Mountain and received the pattern for the tabernacle from God. Remember, God told him, write down everything the way you have seen it on the mountain. So God revealed to Moses in the heavenly places the way that the heavenly tabernacle is structured. So the earthly tabernacle was just a replica of the heavenly throne room and entering into the presence of God in the heavenly throne room in the heavenly tabernacle. Well, Jesus Jesus, who's the mediator of a better covenant, he doesn't enter into an earthly tent or even an earthly temple. He enters into heaven itself, the heavenly tabernacle. And he goes right in, not to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, which is the representation of God coming down and dwelling among his people. But Jesus went into the heavenly tabernacle, into the very throne room of God. He stood before the throne of God and stayed stands there, seated at the right hand of God, even to this day, interceding on our behalf based on his blood, which was shed for us in the new covenant as we place our faith in him. So the high priest might have gone into the earthly temple or tabernacle and entered into the presence of God and dropped dead because the sacrifices were not acceptable. But Jesus entered into the very heavenly presence of God and God accepted his sacrifice. The high priest would go 
in to make intercession for the people, and that intercession may or may not be accepted. But Jesus enters into the very presence of God himself, and his intercession is always accepted because he always prays in alignment with the perfect and pleasing will of God. And he is there interceding for us and praying for us to receive mercy from God, our Father, because we have been adopted as his sons and daughters through faith in Jesus, the Son of God, who laid his life down for us. All right, so we're up to verse 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. So that's what we said. The high priest can only go in once a year, and it's with the blood of the goats on the Day of Atonement. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So under the old covenant, the priest would have to offer sacrifices all the time, every morning, every evening, and every time someone sinned. They would have to go to the temple or the tabernacle and bring a new offering for the new sin that they had committed. Well, the problem with that is that humankind, we are all sin-making machines. It happens all the time just as we function as human beings. So Jesus Christ, he came, offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to do away with sin, to put away sin so that he can stand in the presence of God and intercede for God to show mercy to us, even when we don't deserve it because we are chronically imperfect. No one is perfect except for Jesus. And if you have any level of imperfection in you, if you don't do everything perfectly according to the will of God, that is called sin. Well, Jesus is interceding at the right hand of God for us to receive mercy because of his eternal redemption that he has secured for us by offering himself and entering into the presence of God. So you're starting to see how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. Let's take a look at another scripture. This is Hebrews chapter 8, starting with verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So the better promises, like we said, there's a better hope, a better hope of eternal life. We have eternal redemption that has been secured. It is a better covenant because it is guaranteed with an oath and it has a high priest who lives forever. He doesn't have to offer multiple sacrifices. He offered one sacrifice and that is good enough for eternity. And the promise is eternal life and dwelling with God forever in the world to come because of the sacrifice of Jesus, not because of our own righteousness. The scripture continues. We're at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, that's speaking of what we call the old covenant, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, and this is now quoting from Jeremiah 31, which we talked about as the promise of the new covenant that is to come. See, the old covenant, no one was able to keep it. So God said to Jeremiah and through Jeremiah and the other references that we covered, he said, Yes, I'm going to do a new covenant because this old covenant is not working. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So he's saying it's not going to be like the Sinai covenant, which is the one we call the old covenant. It's not going to be like that. He goes on, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So he's saying what we said with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us and write the laws of God upon our hearts and make us willing 
to do the will of God. And then God says, okay, once you're righteous through the sacrifice of the new covenant, I can be your God and you will be my people. Now, that's what he promised to Abraham. He said to Abraham, I will be your God and your people will be my people. That is the best promise that God could ever make because he is the most high God. He is the only God who made heaven and earth. So we want to be aligned with the one true God. We're up to verse 11. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So that's the end of the quote from Jeremiah 31. So God is saying that he's going to teach each person individually. Now, that doesn't mean that he's teaching people different things. No, he's teaching the same things to everyone by his Spirit the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of those who believe in Jesus. And God writes his laws upon our hearts, and he speaks to us by his Spirit to show us his will and his ways and to guide us in the way that we should go. So he's saying, you don't need now a priest or a Levite to teach you the word and the ways of God, because they will all know me. They will all be priests. They will all have a direct connection to me in the new covenant. This is better promises. This is a better hope because God will speak to us directly rather than through a priest or a representative. The old covenant was unable to bring individual people close to God. Only the high priest could draw near to God. But now the new covenant, all of us can draw near to God and enter into his presence because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made. All right, let's keep going and look at another scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 3, starting with verse 5. This is the Apostle Paul speaking about the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So the letter was written on tablets made of stone, and he's about to talk about that. But the letter brings condemnation. The letter is a list of obligations that you must fulfill in order to be right in God's sight. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit is that because you are made right in God's sight because of the sacrifice of Jesus, now the Holy Spirit leads you into the things that are pleasing to God as you will obey the Holy Spirit. We're up to verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death, that's what he's calling the old covenant, the ministry of death, because all it did was prove disobedience and condemn everyone as sinners in rebellion against God because no one was able to keep the requirements of the old covenant. And so everyone was condemned to death because they couldn't keep its requirements. So if the ministry of death carved on letters of stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of of its glory, which was being brought to an end. So remember, when the law was given, God descended onto Mount Sinai in the blazing fire and the smoke and the thunder and the Israelites, they were terrified to look at this. So the Israelites could not even gaze at the Lord. And then when Moses would spend time in the presence of God, his face would shine because of the glory of God. But all of that was being brought to an end. The scripture goes on. We're at verse eight. Will not the ministry of the spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, then the ministry of righteousness must exceed it in glory. So the law, as I said, it's the ministry of condemnation and death. All the law can do is condemn you to death because no one has been able to fulfill its requirements. So everyone is condemned and everyone is doomed for death. But it had glory. It was glorious when it was introduced. Remember, the word for glory means weightiness or weight. So the weight of the old covenant was that this was the only people, Israel were the 
the only people in the whole entire world that had a covenant relationship with the God who created heaven and earth. That is glorious, but it put the weight onto the people that they had to fulfill its obligations, but it was still glorious to have a connection at all with the Most High God, maker of heaven and earth. But now the new covenant is the ministry of righteousness. So the new covenant doesn't bring condemnation. The new covenant brings righteousness by grace through faith. By simple faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness, we are accounted as righteous, just like Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. That is what we have in the new covenant. So therefore, we stand before Jesus as if we had never sinned. It's not that we are perfect in and of ourselves, but when we stand before God, he sees us as perfect because of the perfectness of Jesus, because of the righteousness of Jesus. We're at verse 10. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpassed it. So the new covenant, if you had a choice between the weight and the burden of obedience to God being on your shoulders, as opposed to it's already been paid for in full, which one would you choose? Well, if there was only one option, that's pretty glorious, and you would do your best to uphold the terms that were required of you. But now that there's another option, uh, I'll take that one, thank you. I'll play, okay, the one where it's all paid for me already. So the old one is coming to have no glory at all because it has been surpassed by something better that has been introduced. The new covenant is better than the old covenant. We're at verse 11. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory— much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what is being brought to an end. So we can enter boldly into the presence of God. We don't have to be covering it up. We enter boldly into the presence of God because of the righteousness of Jesus. But Paul goes on, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. So Moses is no longer in this world. Paul is not talking about the veil that covered Moses's face. He's talking about the veil that covers the hearts of Jewish people the veil of condemnation and death and the attaining of righteousness through their own efforts. The veil remains even when they hear the law of God. To this day, he's speaking specifically of Jewish people. And he goes on, because only through Christ, only through the Messiah, is that veil taken away. We're at verse 15. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, that means the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What is that freedom? The freedom is that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten Son. The burden of keeping the law has been removed from us. The burden, the shackles of the law, putting all of the demands on us, has been fulfilled in the perfectness of Jesus, in the sacrifice of Jesus. So now we are are set free from condemnation, from death, and from the obligation to meet the expectations and requirements of the law. There is freedom from the curse. There is freedom from condemnation. There is freedom from sin and death because of what Jesus has done. So he goes on, verse 18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we now behold, we look upon Jesus, the glory, the weightiness of someone who laid his life down for us, and not just a person who laid down his life for us, but a God who laid down his life for us and is now ascended into the heavens, seated at the right hand of the Father. We behold his glory. And as we begin to comprehend that, to behold that, 
to behold the beauty of what he has done and who he is and the heart of love, the determination of God to love and to bless us. We are transformed by that love, by that mercy, by the glory of who Jesus is and what Messiah has done for us. All right, so that was some more points on how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant, but the old covenant is still in effect as long as heaven and earth remain. But let's take a look at the language that is used to express that. So this is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. All right, so obsolete. Obsolete does not mean that it's ineffective or that it is completely done away with. If you look into the Greek in that word, the word obsolete describes something that is worn out. It has been worn out over time or through use, and it is about to be done away with, but it is not already done away with. It's not the same word. So it's a very old version of something, but it still works. It's just not the most latest, greatest thing, the most effective thing anymore. It's worn out, but that doesn't mean that it's been thrown away. Thrown away is a different word altogether. Obsolete means that it's old. It's an old version. So the best way that I can describe this is that when the automobile first came on the scene, people were using a horse and buggy to get around. So the automobile came out, and the automobile was a superior form of transportation. It could go farther. It could go faster. It required fuel that wasn't hay, and it didn't need its shoes changed. Yeah, you'd have to change the tires and fill it with gas, but it wasn't the same as a horse who needed a break or needed to eat or needed to rest its feet or had the weaknesses of a living being. The automobile was a machine, so you could drive it as long and as hard as it would possibly go. The automobile was a superior form of transportation. But even when the automobile came out, people didn't stop using the horse and buggy. No, the horse and buggy and the automobile were on the road for many, many years, even decades after the automobile came out. It took a long time for the automobile to completely replace the horse and buggy. And there are places in the world today where you can still find horse and buggy or bull cart and buggy or all kinds of animals and buggies that will take you around in various parts of the world. But the automobile is still a superior form of transportation. So it's here now. So it makes the old form of transportation obsolete. It doesn't mean that it's ineffective, doesn't mean that it doesn't work, doesn't mean that it's thrown out forever. It just means that something better has come along. So like I said, if you had a choice between a covenant where the obligation of obedience was all on you, or a covenant where the obligation of obedience had already been met in full and all of your mistakes had been paid for already, which one would you choose? Well, I would choose the one where everything's already been paid for already and it's a free gift for me rather than I have to fulfill it myself. So that's what's going on between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant is still around. So with the automobile example, automobile people who immediately got into the automobile, they would look at the horse and buggy and think that it was archaic and slow and challenging and had all kinds of problems. But to horse and buggy people, the automobile, it seems reckless, it goes too fast, it's dangerous, it's unproven, and it's so modern that it might not even be moral and it might not even be ethical. We're not sure about this thing. So you can understand there are different perspectives on the old and the new covenant. And Jesus even said something along these lines about old wine and new wineskins. So let's look. This is Luke chapter 5, verse 37, he said, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one after drinking old wine desires the new, for they say the old is good, or even some translations say the old is better. So people who are used to and accustomed to the old covenant, namely Jewish people, 
who are observing the old covenant to the best of their ability, when they look at the new covenant, it seems reckless, it seems immoral, it seems lawless, it seems like there's just this liberty that is not and could not possibly be from God. So I want you to understand the perspective here about the old and the new covenant. So even though the new covenant is in effect today, the old covenant also remains in effect and will remain until the end of the age. That's the term limit on the old covenant. And again, these scriptures from Jeremiah make that clear. So Jeremiah 31, which is the scripture, that is the portion where Jeremiah is describing the new covenant. This comes immediately after that, starting with verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. So he's saying the fixed order of this heaven and this earth that I established at creation, if that fixed order ever departs before me, then I will cease to hold covenant with Israel as a people. Well, this fixed order of creation is still in effect until the new heavens and the new earth are put into effect. Well, Jeremiah 33, again, he says something similar, starting with verse 25. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes and have mercy on them. So God is again saying, I'm going to keep my promises to my people. And he's saying, as long as this fixed order remains, then my promises will remain. God is a covenant keeping God and he will not violate the covenants that he has made. But let's look also, Jesus said this about the law. He says, Matthew 5, 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So that's Jesus speaking and making it clear that the law remains intact and in place until the end of the age, until heaven and earth pass away. But then, at the end of the age, the conditions which end the Old Covenant will take effect. So here we're going to look at some scriptures from the Old Testament and then how they will be fulfilled at the end of the age. So Isaiah 51 verse 6 says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not never be dismayed. Well, the fulfillment of this is 2 Peter 3.10. He says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So the day of the Lord will come. This heaven and this earth will vanish, and then the old covenant will be done away with. It will no longer be obsolete. It will be done away with completely. Let's look at another one, Psalm 102, starting with verse 25. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Well, Jesus, speaking of himself, he said, Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So Jesus, that's another statement which anyone who knew the scriptures would know that Jesus was declaring himself to be God. Only God's words will not pass away. Only God will not pass away. Only God is eternal. So Jesus is saying heaven and earth, yes, they are going to pass away, but my words will remain. My words will not pass away. So Again, these are just scriptures talking about the end of the age. So let's look at Isaiah 60, starting with verse 19. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. So what Jeremiah said is that God's saying, as long as the sun and 
and the moon and the stars are fulfilling the fixed order of this earth, then the covenant will remain. But Isaiah is saying the day is coming when the sun will not be, the moon will not be, the stars will not be. God is going to be the light. And we see that fulfilled in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, where we enter into the world to come. This is verse 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Eternal One. He is God. It's His words that will not pass away. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then one more here, Isaiah 65, verse 17. He says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. And we see that fulfilled also in Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, there's a lot in those scriptures about the new heavens and the new earth. We're not talking about that in this particular class. We're talking about how at the end of the age, the requirements for the old covenant being done away with will be fully met. So until that time, the law is still in effect for the Jewish people, and they can attempt to observe it, attempt to keep it, attempt attempt to obey it. However, unless they put their faith in Jesus as their Messiah and the mediator of the new covenant that God promised to them through their very own prophets, unfortunately, they are doomed to destruction, whether in this age or at the end of this age, because they have no way of attaining righteousness. No one has ever been able to keep the law and meet the requirements of the law for righteousness except for Jesus. Jesus. No one has ever been able to do it. And because there is no temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem since 70 AD, there has been no temple there. So there is no way for them to offer sacrifices for sin. Their sin has not been atoned for for the past 2,000 years. They need the sacrifice of Messiah. They need the blood of Jesus to atone for their sins, not just as a nation, but as individual people. They will be judged each individually, not as a nation. And we're going to talk about that when we discuss Romans 9 through 11. So they must, they must turn from the old wineskin of the law, even though it's terrifying to them because they're horse and buggy people. They think the automobile is reckless and lawless. They say the old wine is better, but they must turn to Messiah to participate through faith in the new covenant to receive their eternal salvation, better hope, better promises, better priesthood, sworn with an oath, better covenant to enter into the new covenant to receive eternal salvation. I also want to clarify that this is not dual covenant theology. Now, dual covenant theology has been created in the past several decades. There has been this theology created where Jewish people are saved by the old covenant, and therefore there's no assertion and there's no reaching out to the Jewish people to tell them that they need to put their faith in Yeshua as their Messiah for their salvation. Now, unfortunately, that is a lie from the pit of hell, and it has silenced many people from witnessing to Jewish people that need to hear the word of Messiah so that they can believe and be saved. So let's just be clear. There is no salvation in the old covenant law. Yes, the old covenant law remains. And the Jewish people over the course of the past 2000 years, they have experienced the cycles of blessing and curses because they are still under the old covenant law. But there is no salvation in the Old Covenant law. They cannot attain righteousness by their own obedience, and there's no temple for them to offer sacrifices to atone for their sin. So there is no salvation in the Old Covenant law. Salvation is only through faith in Yeshua, the Messiah, who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for us to receive mercy based on what he has done for us. But let's just be clear. Romans 3, verse 20, for by works of the law, no human being 
wrongdoing will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Through the law, you start to understand that you are in violation of God's ways. But through the new covenant, you come to understand that you could never attain perfect obedience in God's sight. So Jesus came and did it for you. And all you have to do is believe. And just as a quick note also, for those who have heard dual covenant theology or are confused by this, the one new man from Ephesians 2.15, Jew and Gentile are one new man in Messiah. That means in Messiah. Jews who have put their faith in Jesus and Gentiles who have put their faith in Jesus. It is not Jewish people who do not believe Jesus and Gentiles who believe Jesus. That is not one new man. One new man is Jewish people and Gentiles that through faith in Jesus have been made into a new creation, a new type of humanity when they put their faith in in Jesus, when they put their faith in Messiah. It is not Old Covenant Jews and New Covenant Gentiles together. That is a misquote. That is a false teaching. One new man is Jews and Gentiles in the superior New Covenant together through faith in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. (music) 